you guys, if you guys are ready, maybe we, we, can, we can start. Um, first things first, thank you for coming out. I know it's uh, right in the middle of a, a holiday. It's uh, Saturday. This is super early. Like uh, usually on, a, on Saturdays, I don't even, don't even wake up before 10 a.m. So like, you know, thank you for, for being here. Like uh, I'm inspired by you just because you are here. It's raining outside. This is actually amazing. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, for the next you know, 40 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about resilience by design. Um, I'm going to go a bit deeper into what resilience means and what design means and uh, how those two actually go together. Uh, so the agenda for this conversation, I broke down into three different parts. I think it's going to uh, make it super clear. First, let's you know, really understand resilience, what is, it's all about. Uh, second, uh, of course, it's a closure conference, so let's get down to code. Let's get our hands dirty. Uh, we're going to build a tiny little resilient system. Um, hopefully, that's going to be fun. Uh, and then, last but not least, I always like putting some takeaways at the end. Um, all the code in this in this presentation is also like open source and whatnot, so that we can even take those things home. Uh, but I also want a couple of principles to be in our mind. Uh, just before we go into that, uh, so my name is Tiago Lucini, and a couple of facts about me. Uh, first, I my first line of code was in 1989, so this year uh, um, will be 30 years since my last uh, my first line of code. And uh, you know, back then, of course, internet didn't exist, JavaScript didn't exist. So my dad, trying to be supportive of uh, of my hobby of computing, he gave me a book about computers, and then uh, my first book was a book about COBOL. So uh, I, I, I really hope that many of you have never even seen COBOL or even heard about COBOL. I really hope so. But uh, 10 years later, I was even invited by uh, uh, a bank to work on COBOL. So I, not only I read the book, I, I, I learned it. I, I went to school for it. Very useless. Um, my personal specialty slash love slash uh, stuff that I do, uh, I really like business in technology, technology in business. For me, technology or engineering in general in the vacuum doesn't really work. For me, like, we have to make money out of uh, technology and technology has to make money to other people and to us as well. So uh, I'm fascinated um, uh, about those two. So all my, my academic stuff is by uh, combining those two. And I really hope that uh, part of this resilience conversation also, also connects those principles in your mind, because a, a product that is not resilient is not a good product. It's not a product that's going to give you money, or at least not a lot of it. Uh, last but not least, uh, I have English as a second language, if you haven't noticed. So I will be using words that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, sorry, it's a bad, shame on you, <laughs> I guess. Like I've been, I've been trying for 25 years, so, so yeah, it's still a work in progress. Um, I work for a company called Work & Company, awful name, uh, because it's always a challenge to say where do you work. I work at work. Uh, but, uh, and what is the name of the company? Work & Company, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, and what we do is uh, we basically build digital products um, uh, and digital products for companies like Facebook, Apple, uh, Google. I think Google is on the list here as well. We have some, some more traditional clients as well, like Marriott, uh, MasterCard. Um, uh, they come to us, you know, searching for uh, improvements in some features on their products or um, uh, building products from scratch as well. Uh, our team is uh, 300 people, uh, 100 uh, designers, around you know, 100 uh, uh, strategists, product managers, uh, and then everyone else is design, uh, 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 engineers and technology, uh, technologists in general. Um, some of us do closure as well. We have a very diverse team. So if you're interested, you know, check it out. We are always uh, recruiting cool people. And our team is amazing. So uh, my, let's, let's think about resilience a little bit. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about my, my personal experience or my personal journey uh, when it comes to resilience. Do you guys know who this is? You guys know? Like some people know. I think that it's a good sign that he's holding one of his books, so his name is on the book as well. So this is, this is Arthur C. Clarke, uh, the, the, one of the biggest writers of science fiction, and uh, 
Uh, if you don't know him by name, you probably saw one of his movies or one of his uh, 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 stories. Uh, he wrote the 2001, An Odyssey in Space, so you probably saw the movie, like it's, a, it's, a, it's an iconic movie. And um, back in the 80s, more or less at the same time I was reading that book about Cobol, uh, he wrote a book uh, called uh, The Songs of Distant Earth. Uh, and it's a fascinating book, and it's like a, it's it's one of his personal books as well, uh, because uh, it's the one book that he tried to be as realistic as possible. And of course, we're talking about science fiction, so it is science fiction at the end of the day. But uh, but he was like, you know, what if you know we really try to do space travel right? Like you know, forget hyperdrives, forget you know quantum drives, forget all these things. You know, what if we actually put the numbers down? And he starts with three premises. Um, the first premise is Earth is doomed. Like the sun is going to explode. You know, we, we, find, we find that out at some point that we are sitting on a thinking, thinking, bump, thinking bump, bomb. So it will explode. Earth is doomed. Uh, we need to get away from here. Uh, second, he's like, you know what? It is really impractical to fly uh, or to travel uh, anywhere beyond 1 20th of, uh, of the speed of light. We're never going to be faster than that. That's super fast already, right? So we're never going to go faster than that. There's no quantum drive. There is no jump. There is no wormhole. This is it, right? It's, it's his premise. Uh, also, like if you consider like the nearest exoplanet um, that he kind of calculated back then would be around 400 years from here, right? Like uh, considering the, the 1 20th of, uh, of the speed of light. He's also very uh, pessimistic about hibernation. He's like, no, we're never going to be able to crack that. We're not going to be able to hibernate. We, what it means in practice is that, well, we can't travel to the exoplanet, right? Uh, so if you take those three premises in, uh, it's kind of shitty, right? Like, how do we really get, go somewhere? Like, how do, how do we maintain our legacy? How do we make humans survive, like our amazing legacy? Um, and he comes up with this idea. I couldn't really find a better picture, but he comes up with this idea of a seed ship. Uh, and this idea of a seed ship is like it's a ship that carries the DNA material from the human race. Uh, it's completely autonomous. So it will basically travel for 400 years or even more, uh, get to, this, uh, the, uh, the, to, to the destination, to the planet, where we are going to be planted, which basically means he doesn't go into details, but like there will be robots that will basically open up all the, the, the packages and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, implant us or our DNA into artificial wombs, wait for us to, 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 to be born again, and then take us through an educational process for a few generations until we actually become human again, right? And it's a fascinating thing. This is actually uh, from, from page, this is a, a, a screenshot from pages of the book where he's uh, really putting the math together. He's like, you know, how long this whole thing would, would take and like what's happening in which order and how these things would go. Uh, I just find it fascinating that like a, a science fiction writer was really putting a lot of effort into this. Uh, no wonder he was one of the science fiction writers that came up with the idea of the GPS uh, because he was like, oh, it's a good idea. We have satellites up there. Why don't they, you know, tell us where we are because they're stationary, blah, blah, blah. He was the one that came up with the idea first. Um, but that's interesting because like, he was thinking about this, and uh, if you really think about the system behind this, this, this whole endeavor, it would have to be a system that first has to survive uh, for at least 400 years of space travel. Uh, it has to survive for around 400 years more until what he calls stasis, which is like when, uh, when humanity is now stable, right? Like it's now in a stable uh, stage. Uh, and if you think about it, it, this has to be like a system, like a software plus hardware plus biological stuff that has to run for 800 years without rebooting, has to run for 800 years without failing, or when it fails, to be able to recover you know, from, that, from those failures. Uh, so he doesn't really, uh, Arthur C. Clarke doesn't really mention this, but uh, this is the very description of a resilient system, right? Like, uh, 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 and of course, this is a closure conference, so I, I'm, I'm forced to show a dictionary uh, entry of like what resilience means. Um, it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. Uh, 
and I, I love the situation here because uh, we're really conflating two different things. We're conflating uh, resilience and failure. And uh, one of the first things I want you guys to remember is that resilience does not mean the absence of failure. So if you're thinking about a system that will last for 800 years, uh, it will definitely fail at some point. So it's kind of impossible, right? Uh, resilience, on the other hand, means recovering quickly from failures so that those failures don't really pile up, that those failures don't really uh, make the whole system uh, uh, fall down. Uh, it's actually an interesting thing. Uh, I was rereading re the, the, the book um, for this presentation, and then uh, I, I had never noticed, because this was back in the 80s when I read the book, uh, but he mentions uh, something called graceful degradation. And that quickly, if you guys, you know, those of you, those of us who are in, uh, uh, in UI development, web development, you know, we usually say, well, graceful degradation or, or a progressive improvement when we, we want to say, well, if you're running on a crappy browser, uh, it, we, we still need to show something, right? And, um, and for me, it's almost the same way. Like he, he was thinking, like, if a system fails, if a component fails on the system, uh, how can we gracefully degrade to the next level of performance? So if there is one thing that, I, that you guys remember from this call, you know, you know it's this thing, like uh, components will fail. And that period is important, components will fail. Resilience by design means taking resilience into account since the very beginning of the product creation. We're gonna walk through some of these concepts along the way, but like this is the core of this talk, right? Like uh, uh, stuff will break, and you need to think about those things that might break since day one. Um, what are some of the things that can break? You know, I had a gigantic list. I had to actually stream down for this presentation, but uh, uh, I really want to focus on a couple of things uh, and a couple of anecdotes as well. First, everything you depend on. So if you have a dependent system, if you have an API, if you have um, you know, something you need to call, that stuff might fail. Uh, maybe that stuff is not failing, but the connection between you and that stuff will fail. Definitely. Uh, one thing we forget sometimes, especially if we're running on the cloud and whatnot, is that storage is also something that could fail. Usually it's an external storage, sometimes it's even like beyond, beyond, uh, beyond the network, uh, so you will fail and you can actually com compound with the failure of the networks as well. Uh, one thing, and, and I loved Crux yesterday from, 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 from John, uh, but that could fail. I'm, I'm super sorry. That might not be available. <laughs> so a database could fail. A database may not be there when you need it. And the last one is the one that, I, that, that, that really surprised me because I heard this on a um, uh, meeting once with a bunch of engineers, right? So I'm calling here the cloud. Uh, the cloud will fail. And what I mean about that, that and I'm, I'm sorry that I, I will have to actually tell the story, we were in a meeting, um, uh, we were gonna use Firebase uh, as, 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 as one of the, uh, the persistence uh, uh, solutions for the, for, the, for the product that we were building. And then a very smart engineer you know, brought it up. Like, what if Firebase fails? What if Firebase is not there? And then another engineer said, don't worry about that. Firebase is on the cloud, it will always be there. It will always be available. And, and, and that took me, you know, back for a second because it was like, no, the cloud is not there. Uh, if you guys remember, and this hasn't been long ago, um, I think it was like two years ago, three years ago, that S3 went down for a few hours and the whole internet stopped working because everyone believes that S3 is always gonna be there. And don't get me wrong, like uh, maybe there is no way to protect yourself against, against some of these, uh, but uh, uh, at least the awareness that it might not be there, like it's something that we need to have in the back of our mind. So let's get practical. And uh, I, I want to build a seed sheep. Like that's a, I want to build this sheep that's gonna you know, fly for 400 years and then, and, then, and then survive there for 400 years more. Uh, of course, I don't have time to do that. We don't have time to do that in the, during this presentation. So, so let's build just a tiny little piece of it. And then uh, the piece we're building and the piece that we're tasked, uh, tasked to build is uh, there is this DNA vault that's carrying all the DNA material for all the humanity. Uh, and 
we need to build a DNA status system. So this status system is going to be, you know, hitting this this DNA vault just to make sure everything is right and report it to potentially more systems downstream um, that will act on some of the potential failures or or whether you know DNA is rotting or whatever when, what happens when DNA goes bad. Um, and of course, because this is this is in the future, right? Like, we're, and uh, this is super modern. This is super advanced. Uh, so, the Vault system has a REST API that we can we can hit over HTTP. Very easy, very straightforward. Our code is going to sit there on the on the on the reporting system, and we're just going to you know get data from the from the uh, from the REST API from for the DNA Vault. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think are, are instrumental to uh, building anything resilient in, uh, around this space. Uh, the first one is like a, it has to be easy to implement. We need to have uh, enough ergonomics that we don't have to really think too hard about it. It just comes as second nature. Uh, second, whatever we do has to be also easy to monitor because uh, if we don't know what's happening, or if we don't know how, how our, res uh, our resilience is actually working, we're not going to be able to uh, respond accordingly. And then last but not, not least, uh, uh, we have to be able to test it out as well. We need to be able to see, like, is the resilience really working or is the system failing? Or, like, what is failing at the end of the day? So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. First things first. Uh, Easy to implement. Uh, I couldn't find anything that was super easy in Clojure. So as traditional <laughs> enclosure community as a whole, uh, I ended up actually building a set of libraries, a set of tools that, uh, that made it a little bit easier. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper onto this. Uh, uh, it's, the libraries are not that big. I think that each one has probably like a, a, a hundred lines of code. They are super uh, 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 streamlined. Uh, but we needed them, and we wanted to make it easy, so we spent some time uh, doing those uh, and expanding. So remember, like recapping, this is what we're trying to build, a DNA status system that hits a vault system. And usually our happy case would be something like this, right? You know, our consuming system is on the left-hand side. We write a function that hits the external system, HTTP, everyone is happy, everything is fine. Uh, in practice, uh, you know, this is probably code that you would actually write in, in, in Clojure. No rocket science here. It's a simple function. You know, it, it uh, gets a, um, it sends a, an HTTP get to that, that URL, and we're all good to go. However, uh, this call might take a lot of time, right? Let's just start there. Like, let's start small. Uh, and usually, when we start talking about like, well, this takes uh, too much, too much time. So like, what we do, like, we, we embed some time out in the very HTTP call. Uh, this is if you've if never done this, that there is something weird. Oh, like, tell me what you are doing because like I, I don't know what's happening. Uh, just just out of an uh, out of an example, I for this presentation, I went into our our projects uh, in our database, we have uh, like around 400 um, uh, repos, and I searched for timeout. And this is one of the commits that I found, and let me zoom in so that you guys can see it. Uh, this is a very common thing. Like, uh, I, I, I challenge you, like, go through your, your repos and your company repos and look for timeout entries. People will increase the timeout when stuff goes wrong. Uh, they do that because systems suck and they, they don't work. And then, you know, your consuming system is actually failing because of like cascading uh, dependencies. And it was already 30 seconds and they had to actually bump it up to 60. 60 seconds is a whole minute just to wait for one HTTP call to respond. This is, this is insanely bad, right? Uh, I'm actually showing this because uh, 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 the point is, do I really trust this function, this, this get DNA status? I have to tell you, well, maybe I'm really paranoid. I don't. And I don't know like, what the other system is doing on the other side. I don't know who is actually maintaining this. If this is on a microservices environment, like they are bumping up their timeout. So I would love to have something like this. I want to decorate this get DNA status function get a better version of this, this, uh, this uh, uh, get DNA status uh, um, uh, function uh, that is decorated with a time limiter that I control myself, right? 
So this is exactly the ergonomics that I was going for in our library. And uh, this is what we ended up with. Right? So you have to do some uh, ceremony, you have to do your, all, the, all your requires, but you create a time limiter, give it a fancy name, and then you decorate your function. Now you start calling the better get DNA status and you're gonna have a uh, proper timeout. Uh, in practice, um, the, the, cre the time limiter create function has a couple of default settings. Uh, of course, you can, you can do whatever you want, but the default is a, is a timeout of uh, uh, 1,000 milliseconds, so a whole second. Uh, and because we also wanted something uh, to control the flow of the requests, so we also added the, uh, we, we send the, 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 the created function into a separate thread. Uh, and then we control its life cycle separately because uh, that function might uh, have some um, side effects that you might want to control separately. So you, you might want to do something like this, like reduce your timeout, but then you just let the function do its thing because it, it will continue to run anyway. It might fail, it might work, you report that on the side, you report that elsewhere. Uh, this is awesome, right, from a time limiting perspective, but uh, stuff will still fail. So, like, remember the, the, the premise that components will fail and that's where we're, we're coming from. Uh, so, stuff will fail, stuff will time, time out. Uh, every now and again, we need to, to retry. Uh, this is a perfect example for retry because uh, uh, get is, should be at least in the potent. So, it's fine to retry as many times as we want. And we do the very same ergonomics that we had for, for time limiter but with a retry. We, we create a retry, um, and then we decorate our function uh, with a retry around it. Uh, similar to the time limiter, uh, the retry has also a couple of default uh, um, uh, entries, uh, default settings. Uh, the default ones are like a retry three times maximum, uh, and wait between retries, wait for 500 milliseconds between retries. Um, of course, this could still take a lot of time, but, uh, but at least uh, you are uh, retrying as much as possible. Uh, one thing that we ended up doing uh, that's, that, that ended up being very useful, um, and let me back up, uh, back up a little bit. Uh, if you have a lot of consumers trying to hit the server at the same, or the, if we have a lot of calls from our DNA status system hitting the DNA vault at the same time, and then all of them start failing, and then all of them start actually uh, waiting exactly 500 milliseconds, uh, you're gonna actually have a gigantic backlog of requests for the server you know, coming up in a, in a, in a few seconds uh, when this, the, the, the vault system comes back online. So what we had to do was uh, implement also in interval functions that we can uh, fine tune the way that the, the intervals are actually calculated. So uh, a traditional approach, for instance, is doing what is called exponential back off, where uh, the very first retries are really close to each other, and then the, as, as you do more and more retries, like the, the, the time between retries actually gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and it's such a common uh, 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 practice, it's such a common uh, a pattern that uh, we also embedded a couple of these functions into uh, the library and you can easily do something like this. So basically I'm just specifying that the inter interval function is uh, uh, exponential back off, it starts, it's starting at 100 milliseconds and uh, uh, increasing by 50% every single try. Uh, which is exactly that curve. So, you know, I, I, I mapped that curve to this uh, curve here. Now, uh, you can also specify your own, your own function, of course, if you want to, uh, but the, that library uh, already has five or six functions that, uh, that were, we found useful. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, like uh, we solved those problems independently, the retry and the time, the time, uh, time limiter, uh, but they really compose amazingly well. So. For me, composability, and for all of us functional developers, it should be amazing, it should be a thing to, to strive for. And uh, this is an example of uh, those two composing together. So I have the retry, I have the time limiter, and I'm getting my crappy uh, HTTP request, and then decorating it with a retry, decorating with the time limiter. And it's uh, a now, what it means in practice is, I will retry for three times, I will uh, have a little bit of a waiting time between every single retry, and the whole thing is going to have a time limiter of uh, a time budget of a thousand milliseconds, right? Because that's a default. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that uh, if you 
Compose, uh, composability gives you also the option, gives, gives you also the, 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 the semantic power, let's put it this way. Uh, and this is what we have noticed, noticed as we start actually using these ergonomics, is that our conversations became way more uh, strategic about the way to combine these things. Uh, so what I mean in practice is, this retry time limiter in this setup basically means we're gonna retry in a separate thread for X times, and then there is a whole timeout of Y milliseconds for the whole retry. If you shift it around, you have the time limiter first and the retry after, so each of the X retries will have a time limit of Y, which is a completely different behavior. And actually, in practice, you know, a very common pattern that we have is something like this, where we have two time budgets. Uh, each of the X retries has a Y millisecond time budget, uh, and then there is a time budget of W milliseconds for the whole retry. This is a very common pattern that has been emerging in our systems, and, uh, and I wanted to share that with you guys as well, because then we, we compose the, the time limiting twice. Uh, great, now we have limiters, uh, retries, and whatnot, but things still fail, right? So like, it's, it's, you want to build up on the fact that uh, 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 stuff will fail. Uh, one good strategy is caching stuff, right? So what if uh, the DNA status, the DNA vault, it's not gonna change very often because you know, it will stay more or less the same for 500 years. Uh, maybe we can cache it for a couple of days, you know, eventually. Uh, so we came up with an interesting pattern um, that works, that composes quite well. So yeah, what if you cached? Uh, the first thing that we did was like creating a, a side effect. So uh, function like this, you know, save to cache uh, that receives the return value of your function and also all the arguments that were used for it and then consider hypothetically that we will be saving this to a cache. Uh, on the way back, we have a fallback strategy. Like what if stuff fails? So we do the other way around. We receive the arguments and then we are able to actually go onto our, onto our cache and then find the entry uh, that has um, uh, the, the return, the previous return value for that, um, for those arguments. And this is exactly what we did. So we created the same wrappers and the same uh, functional decorators so that we can uh, create this composable structure where we have um, the, our better DNA status functional. First it retries, then it saves the, the, the cache, um, the, it saves the cache, then it time limits. If anything fails, it will recover from the cache, right? Of course, I'm giving very descriptive names for the functions and the effects and whatnot here. Uh, this is not from a real code. We try to be a little bit more uh, economical about that. Um, this is exactly what we did as well uh, as part of the, the, the this resilience for the COJ library. Uh, we created a separate system for caching that already has some, uh, some functional stuff for you to do, like in terms of like saving uh, in, onto the cache and recovering from the cache. And uh, Resilience for COJ uh, cache library also is built on top of the Jcache um, uh, spec for, for Java. Uh, so what it means in practice is that uh, we abstracted away the cache implementation from the, from the interface proper. So uh, a couple of different um, uh, providers of caching are available in the market. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but we've tested with uh, some of these. Uh, we're currently using Finispan. Uh, each one of these have like different pros and cons. Uh, uh, cache 2K, super simple, just runs in, your, in process and, and, and works fine. Uh, EH Cache, um, uh, they, they have some persistence uh, features that are interesting. Uh, InfiniSpan has uh, uh, a cluster, so you have a zookeeper and you can distribute your whole uh, cache um, uh, in, in memory and in disk as well. Redison does uh, some uh, uh, Redis interface, so you can have to actually reuse your Redis cluster to do some of the cache. Uh, and Apache Ignite is just huge. You guys should check it out. Just, they do a gazillion different things uh, from even database perspective and querying perspective. Uh, but we didn't get there yet. Uh, the kind of setup that we're using is something like this, where we have an, uh, uh, but instead of having Ignite cluster, we have a, a, an InfiniSpan cluster. And all our clients, are, all our nodes, are basically just heating the same cache. The beauty of this is that uh, by using this tiny little library, uh, if one of the nodes um, uh, saves something to the cache, 
and another node fails, the other node will be able to recover what is from the cache that was put on the first, from the first node. So it's a very um, uh, interesting you know, uh, approach. Uh, default options for our cache is like, uh, they are like this. Uh, the caching one is a, is a very interesting one because uh, um, by default, it, our, our preference was that, uh, that it would actually be an eternal cache and then you manually uh, destroy it if you want to. Uh, but of course you can also um, say that it expires after a certain amount of time so that, uh, that you have a time to live and the cache entries. Uh, this is not a default also because uh, some of the providers that provide cache uh, mechanisms, they have different ways of dealing with expiration because uh, that you don't want to actually have back uh, load on your cache. Um, so, so you might actually want to do those things on this side as well. Uh, and, and this interface also allows you to just connect to your uh, data grid or just do all the setup settings that you want uh, on your um, cache uh, configuration as well. So a recap now, just because like a, with those one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code, so what we are doing in those six lines of code with a simple uh, threading macro, First, we are retrying three times. We give 500 milliseconds of waiting time between retries. In case of success, we cache it. If the whole thing does not respond in 500 milliseconds, we give up. In case of failure or because we gave up, we, ret we return a cached version. And then if your cache is distributed, also your cache is gonna come from one of the nodes in your distributed cache uh, with six lines of code. Um, uh, so it's uh, super easy to implement. Uh, last but not least, oh, sorry, I still have two more points. Uh, your cache might still uh, uh, not be there, right? So it, it is kind of an interesting problem. The way we are using the cache here is just like in case of failure. Uh, it doesn't really feel like cache, right? Like, uh, you know, I really want to sometimes use the cache as cache, like a, uh, if the entry is there, just return me the entry. So what we did, we created a memoized style for our um, uh, decorators. So you can use your cache to decorate the very uh, uh, pipeline you have, the pipeline of decorators that you have. And if you do something like this, uh, what, which is like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but like I just added the cache at the end of the, the stack, just that last little line there. Now instead of six lines, I have seven. Uh, and what we are doing here is like, a, we return a cache cop if available. If not, it will ignore. If not, it would actually do all the retrying, all the time limiting, all the caching that we talked about earlier. So we changed the behavior quite completely just by decorating uh, you know, with one uh, little line at the end. Uh, I have to say, like, uh, this is a very common pattern that we have uh, for some of these external systems, and uh, that speeds the, the, the our products you know, quite a bit. It speeds the performance of our products quite a bit. Um, uh, then now, definitely last but not least, cool. Uh, we're caching, we're trying, we're like doing a bunch of stuff. However, there is what I call systemic uh, cascading failures. Uh, shit can go wrong and can go wrong miserably. Like, uh, you know, we've been doing this for so many years, we know that stuff will go wrong. Uh, and usually what we expect in a, in a happy path is something like this. I had to animate. The user will request something to our HTTP server, our system. Our system depends on a gazillion different things. Everything is green, everything is fine, everything re returns. And then this is a little bit more advanced in our DNA system because like we depend on you know four different systems to do some kind of um, uh, computation. We depend on, I don't know, the circle is uh, your database, the triangle is the cloud, uh, something else is the network, I don't care. Uh, but very often, like if things go wrong, this is what happens, right? Like. Uh, our system, our user is gonna hit our system, uh, our system is gonna hit those, those external systems, and one of them is failing, right, because for some reason. And because it's failing and you have that 30 seconds timeout, 60 second timeout, or whatever, sometimes even infinite timeout, your process is gonna actually start piling up because you're gonna, you're gonna really start having like all these calls that are just like piling up on your uh, 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 computational environment, your, your container, or your pr process, whatever, whatever, whatever you're running your stuff, uh, and at some point stuff will, will explode, all right? This is not cool. So this is uh, where uh, uh, circuit breakers, um, this is the reason why circuit breakers were invented. Of course, 
circuit breakers, those specific that I actually picture there, more for, for electrical systems, but uh, this is exactly what uh, circuit breakers do. If one of the circuits in the system is broken, it basically just turns that, that thing off by opening the circuit breaker, and then no more power, no more connectivity goes through that system. So, so the global system continues to work, uh, even if that one connection is, is, is broken, the connection to one house or to one building is broken. Uh, and the, the drawing of that, or the, di the diagram for that, is like your user in a circuit breaker environment you know, hits your process. Uh, there is a, an intermediate layer of a circuit breaker that will interface with external systems. And if one of them is, br is broken, the red one, it, uh, your circuit breaker layer will say, well, you know what? This is not cool. This is actually broken. So let me open the, the circuit breaker and not let any call go through this flow anymore. Uh, this is a very traditional uh, um, uh, idea. Well, it is a traditional idea. Uh, it's been gaining popularity recently. Uh, you guys might have seen Netflix's uh, Hystrix. It's a, a Java library that works quite well for secret breakers. Uh, Alibaba has Sentinel. It's also like a you know, Java base. Uh, uh, it's huge. It does a gazillion different things. And uh, GitHub has Resilience 4J which is the foundation for all the stuff that we are doing from, for Resilience for COJ, therefore the similarity on the name. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper on this. Uh, of course, the closure, the offering on the closure community. Uh, Hystrix has a very nice macro uh, in their contrib packages that you can use. We have used it before, it actually works quite well. And then of course, Resilience 4J now has Resilience for COJ. So you know, if you're interested, you can actually use that. Uh, the, inside a breaker, uh, inside one tiny little breaker, there's a state machine that has one of these three states. Either the circuit is closed, which means all the traffic is going through and everything is fine. If uh, uh, there is a failure rate that actually hits a certain threshold um, and goes beyond the threshold, then you will open the, 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 the circuit breaker. So no traffic is gonna go through that, that um, uh, breaker anymore. Uh, after a waiting period, the, the state changes into half open. This is the approach for Resilience 4J. So it changes into half open, which is like, you no, know, let me try, let me see if this is working, because it might not be working. So that's why you also have like the way back to open, because like, you know, we tried it and it's still broken. So go back to open, wait 60 more sec uh, seconds or whatever, whatever your waiting period is. Uh, otherwise, the system is, is working now, so put it back to closed and everything is fine until it actually breaks again. Uh, Resilience 4, 4 j also has like this interesting concept. All the threshold um, control, all the failure rate controls is actually controlled by a uh, ring bit buffer uh, uh, that actually looks like a ring, but it's uh, anywhere between one bit and, and, um, and uh, 1,024 bits uh, because of the internal uh, data model. But basically, it will, you, for every single call that, that is successful through this system, it will, it will say one, it's okay. If it fails, zero. One, zero. And then when the whole ring is ready, that's when it calculates the, the threshold and decides if, uh, if the, the circuit should be broken or open, should be closed or open. Uh, this is what we did. Same ergonomics, same everything that we have been doing for every single, every little thing. You create a breaker, give it a fancy name, uh, and decorate your function with the breaker. Super straightforward, super easy to use. Same behavior, you gain all that uh, circuit breaker uh, logic for free. Of course, these are some of the default options. Uh, a little bit bigger stuff here, but, uh, and, and very long uh, key names, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, particularly for those in, in, that are not familiar with circuit breakers, this is very convenient, because uh, you can actually look at it and say like, oh, this is the ring buffer size in the closed state, because you decide how many entries, how, how big you want that ring to be. Uh, sometimes you want to make it the ring actually smaller because the system actually fails more often or longer because the system is a little bit more re resilient, or a little bit more, more um, uh, reliable. Uh, of course, because uh, we are doing this in a composable manner, you can definitely do something like this, right? Of course, we are building up on, our, on top of our system, like we retry, we save to the cache, we have a time limiter, we, have, um, we recover from the cache, then we have a break around it, because if anything goes wrong, you know, just close this circuit and recover from the cache in case of a fallback. I wanna go back to the point I was trying to make, like that uh, uh, it is fundamental to, for resilience to have something that is easy to implement. And uh, 
I don't know about you, but I do find this, uh, you know, super easy, maybe because we were doing this for a while. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I want to show, I, I really wanted to describe this a little bit better. So I, I started to put a diagram, a flow diagram of like what was happening in the back. And uh, when I did, I ended up with this. And uh, I'm not going to bother you with this, but like this is what those seven, eight lines of code is, are, are doing, right? And because the whole thing is really composable uh, and uh, the discussions that we normally have uh, in our team are like, should we retry first? Should we time out? Oh, what about the cache? What about this? Does this one need a breaker? Oh, maybe not. So we are basically cherry picking like big functional sections of this diagram. This diagram here is exactly what you saw on this slide here, the previous slide, um, just exploded, right? And uh, I'm not gonna bother you guys into details about this one, but you can definitely cherry pick and move any way you see fit. Um, talking about cherry picking, uh, some of the core benefits that we try to actually embed in the Resilience for COJ uh, library first, very few dependencies, we try to make it super light so that it's fast. You cherry pick what you need, so, so that's why the libraries are broken down. So if you need cache, you just need cache, you don't need anything else. Uh, and I hope you noticed at this point, everything very functional, very composable, so that we can actually plug stuff together like Lego blocks. Remember that I said that uh, another component, another important thing was like uh, stuff that had to be easy to monitor. Uh, this is uh, something that we create embedded in the library as well. We have an event system. So uh, you can create handlers and then listen, like just attach a handler, an event handler to your breaker, to your retry, to whatever it is. Uh, each one of these uh, subsystems has a, a completely different set of events uh, so that you can monitor what is happening uh, with your breaker or with your time limiter or whatever it is. And um, we also have a series of metrics, like these are metrics from the breaker. You can hit a breaker, ask for the mutable <laughs> metrics, that unfortunately that has to be mutable. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and you see exactly how your, your system is working. Uh, we do this a lot through the REPL nowadays to see what's going on, but what we want to do in the future is something like this. So we want to be able to actually monitor, like as soon as we hit the production with some of these systems, we want to be able to have a Kibana system or a CloudWatch, whatever, that actually shows us uh, you know, what's happening with every single node and every single breaker and every single retry. Uh, we are brainstorming how this would go and then also make a plug-in system so that it's easy to do. Uh, the third point that I said was important was like, you know, making something that is easy to test. And one pattern that, uh, that, that has been helping us a lot uh, is doing all our external uh, requests like this. Right? So, so we have our system, we have our domain logic inside of it. Uh, every time we need to access the vault system, this external DNA vault system, whatever external system that we have, uh, we actually do that through a protocol. Uh, and we have the implementation proper behind the protocol. So this is like already a nice structure anyway to hide the, the complexities of external systems from your uh, architecture. But then what we learned is that uh, we can have um, uh, uh, proxy implementations, like a pass-through implementation and a resilient decorated implementation. And we evolved that to have an admin or controllable systems where whoever is actually doing the testing or controlling this can say, you know what, activate this route, deactivate this one, activate that route. The reason why we do this is because uh, sometimes the resilient strategy is so resilient that uh, we don't even know that the, the system in the back is actually failing. So we have to actually make it less resilient. We, we have to actually reduce the lifetime of the cache, for instance, or we have to do something else. So this has proved to be like something amazingly important in our development process because uh, we, can, we can fine tune the resilience strategies uh, uh, accordingly. So remembering like the most important thing, components will fail. Resilience by design means taking resilience into account since the very beginning of the product creation. A couple of takeaways. First thing, uh, assume that things will fail. If you haven't actually done that yet, I really recommend. My one thing here, and that's why I have this, this nice little picture, is like it's a mindset thing. Uh, never be the guy, never be the engineer saying that the cloud is going to be there, like, because it, it will fail. And it's fine if you depend on that like, because there is no other way, right? So just understand that and accept it. Um, 
I think that everything has to be a proactive movement, not a reactive one. So what I mean in practice is, from day one, consider those three things I mentioned, implementation, monitoring, and testing, uh, but also have conversations about how much is too much. Like this is something that, I've been having, that we have been having with our engineers very often. Like, a, well, if you say that S3 might not be available, well, we really need it. There is no other way. Is that fine? Are we okay if S3 goes offline? Maybe we are, right? Maybe we're not. Like we have to actually make a decision and document that decision. Uh, another thing that actually comes up every now and again when we talk about resilience, especially with uh, business people in general, is like, uh, aren't you doing premature optimization? Like you're already thinking about something that might fail two years from now, right? And uh, sometimes it feels like it, I, I have to say. Uh, it, is, it is one of the caveats of this conversation. It is the very reason why we, we chose this ergonomics and this strategy for testing, because then you can cherry pick and you can plug and play and you can test and you can see what's going on. Sometimes even having multiple resilient strategies to see which one works and which one doesn't work. Uh, so is it premature optimization? I don't really think so, but it might actually feel like this. Uh, also, Think about experience, um, um, think about resilience inside your experience design. Uh, one example, uh, this is a Spotify. Every time you open Spotify and you are offline, it's gonna show you that one ugly screen. However, uh, I'm a user, I have like a, a lot of um, uh, uh, offline uh, playlists, so why do, doesn't it show me this? Like it shows me like an error message and uh, it, should, it, it could eventually show me that my offline uh, playlists. And, uh, it's a fascinating thing that I, I really think that someone in there considered the idea that the user will be offline, right? Uh, the fact is, uh, take WhatsApp as an example. Like uh, WhatsApp, if you are off offline or you have no network and you send a message, it will send the message. It will have like the tiny little clock thing if you're a user that will send it later. So we're basically telling you back, saying like, well, I haven't sent it, but you might just ignore it. And uh, for me, that's fascinating from a design perspective, product perspective, because uh, this is uh, Slack's response to uh, uh, sending a message when you're offline. It will basically give you an error message, completely different design approach. WhatsApp had the approach of like, yeah, pretend we sent it and then send it afterwards. Slack had the approach of like, no, tell the user that sh stuff is wrong. And I, I don't think that there is a right and wrong here. You know, it might as well be that uh, Slack is business, so they know that, well, like, yeah, if you're sending something to your boss, like, I quit, you want to know <laughs> that it got through or not, right? Uh, and WhatsApp is more like a social network, so people don't care. So, but for me, the beauty is, like, when I think about all the conversations those designers had in the back, they were thinking about it, right? So back to my point, uh, Thinking about design, uh, uh, thinking about resilience, even as part of design and uh, experience design is important. Uh, resilience is a very important subject. I'm a true believer that it's also something you have to do for life. Uh, and I just want to leave you guys with um, uh, a sentence from Seneca. Um, uh, no man is more unhappy than, than he who never faces adversity, for he is not permitted to prove himself. Uh, for me, like uh, going through adversities as part of our life stories and life's journeys also prepares us for, for, um, uh, for more adversity, I guess, and, uh, and to be more resilient. So hopefully this has been helpful for you guys. Do we have time for, how are you on time? Like, do we have time for questions? I, do we? Yes. Okay, sure, go on. So, so the question is like, uh, uh, I, I have lots of strategies to recover from, from errors, but like, uh, what if it still fails, right? And, and it's awesome, it's a great question because uh, uh, this is the very core of the, of the idea, right? Like that stuff will fail. Um, it, it is how to deal with the exceptions and or the errors or the faults or sometimes we're even calling them anomalies nowadays, right? Because like even the, the semantics of the words are kind of annoying. Uh, one of our preferences, but I have to say that uh, we still haven't settled on, on something, has been to really try to wrap uh, uh, exceptions and errors and whatever it is into standardized maps, especially with closure and uh, abilities we have with X info and X data, uh, that carry as much information about what's happening as possible, right? Um, uh, one of the added values of that is because uh, we are also 
slowly but surely, and this might become like a separate library one day, but uh, embedding those errors with um, uh, recovery strategies for the error, uh, particularly those that are um, like a very good example uh, that, that, that happens very often in the products we build. Um, we have lots of products that actually deal with transactions and credit cards and, and purchases, e-commerce and whatnot. And then sometimes uh, you're trying to make a multi-payment um, uh, transaction where you're adding gift card and a credit card and maybe a discount code. And uh, these are all three separate systems. And then one goes through, two fail, or two go through, one fail. And what happens in practice is that in some of these scenarios, you might actually tell the user that something went wrong uh, so that the user know, knows what's happening. Some, sometimes you might actually say, well, your, your gift card is fine, but your credit card has no money. Uh, so you just can't. And that's what we call like a repeat with change kind of scenario. Because what does the change mean? Like we have to change something. Right, so we are basically communicating all the way up to the, to the UI and to the consuming side that uh, it is a recoverable error, but you will have to change something in the request. And then we have like the, the unrepeatable um, uh, calls, which is like, you no, know, it doesn't matter what you do, like we're fucked. Like, you no, know, it doesn't matter, like we're not gonna be able to get through. Uh, sometimes it is a timeout error. So it is a timeout error in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a post request, so you, you can't just have a retry strategy. So we carry as part of the data load, uh, the data um, uh, map of the error saying, you know what, the user can opt to retry. And then it goes back to the user, and then the user experience will show a, a, a screen or something saying like, well, something failed, do you want to retry? And you say yes. So. To your question about like how to deal with these things, uh, uh, one of my personal views, and uh, I haven't really investigated much like around like what people are doing about it, is that uh, communicating those things all the way in the stack uh, help on the experience as a whole, like make a better experience for users. Uh, it goes back to what Dan was was saying yesterday about like you know are we make, building stuff that is is human or inhuman, right? So for me, like the human is also part of the the, the equation, which in our example is is a bad one because for, for 800 years we didn't have humans, right? But more questions? I'll I'll give it the chance for some someone else if like uh, I'm fine with another one. Oh, there, I'll go back to you. Um, for me. Writing software is always a fight between simplicity and complexity. I was just wondering, has, has your testing like ballooned in complexity? If you're adding in all this, especially things with time and, uh, and cool. maybe results, like for me, okay. it's beautiful what you've done is, is awesome, but I just worry that you know, your testing is gonna be crazy. No, that's that's a that's a great point because um, uh, we have an amazing QA team, so maybe I'm spoiled. <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to say that it ballooned in terms of um, uh, their amount of work, uh, particularly because uh, uh, we embedded this kind of feature as part of our feature flag system anyway, um, which our developers and QA team are already used to. So they are already used to just like go in there, like enable features, disable features, and they have like a map of everything they have to test. Um, so we also like expose, well, resilience strategy A, right? Like, and then we don't really give a lot of details. Like, and then internally from, from our engineer side, we know, well, in the resilience, resilience strategy A, we are doing this, this, and this on these calls. On the B, we are doing this, this, and this on these calls. And then, as they run their test sets and their test scripts, uh, they basically run across those three or four um, uh, combinations, right? Uh, and then we just schedule and reorganize those, those tests based on what is it that we are basically launching uh, for the next sprint. So what it means in practice is that uh, we're not doing this every single sprint, otherwise it would definitely balloon our tests, but we actually deal with those uh, strategies the same way that we're dealing with features. So th this is a new feature that uh, we're not launching yet. You know, turn it on, test it. This is like the, for our deliverable for this sprint. Uh, by the way, next sprint, we're gonna be playing with the resilience because it's a bit weird. So you know, wait for strategy number C or whatever, right? So, but it, that's a very good point. Like uh, our current QA team is great, so that helps. If you have um, less people or they are not really into the whole process and flow, you're gonna have trouble.
Um, I was wondering, you're talking about composing, and we see this really nice example of composing these decorators on one function. How well does this work if you want to kind of start composing maybe more like vertically to say, so we have this get DNA function and that works well, but then maybe I need this as a component of some other data where I have different requirements around what should fail and what it should be doing. That's an amazing question because it is, it is something that now we've been discussing. Um, currently what we do, and I don't think it's really that uh, uh, great from a maintainability perspective, is that uh, we create separate strategies for each one of the calls. Let's say uh, we have a, a DNA vault system, but we have like a DNA life support system or whatever, and then our system on top actually depends on those two, right? Uh, so uh, yesterday, one of the calls we had like a data model as a DAG, and then this is something we have been investigating as well. Is there, is there something we can actually put as part of the library where we specify some of these dependencies and then the dependencies are also decoratable and we get like a, a tree of, of decorators? Um, it is definitely something we've been considering. So far, we're doing that manually, which is not that maintainable. So what I mean in practice is, we're gonna have like the decorators for the better DNA, then we have the decorators for the better life support system, and then we have like the decorator for this that will actually support those two, but then you lose visibility of what's happening. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we actually rely so much on the event system as well, because then we, and we give them unique names, because uh, then we can see that we call this one function and three events were triggered, because it was one event of the, same, the first decorator and then two events of the lower decorators as well. Uh, maybe in the future we could actually do that automatically, use a macro, use like a DAG and, and et cetera. But it's a great question because uh, it, it, uh, our systems are highly dependent on external systems, but, um, but very often we try to avoid that because it's not very maintainable unless you can actually make it even easier, right? Good question. Thank you guys, thank you very much.